sometimes I stumble just because of my size. Welcome into the program, everyone. Great to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to be with us on this Tuesday. Sorry for my absence yesterday. I had to serve my civic duty and go to jury duty. I had that in Elmore County. Turns out I was dismissed. I don't know if it had anything to do with my job or the fact that I'm a very opinionated person. I was dismissed before they even got to the, the next round, so I guess that had nothing to do with it. But it is funny. I I went down there, and, and now I won't be able to be called back for jury duty for another two years. So we'll just see if that takes place. But thank you so much for being with me and bearing with me through my absence. A lot to go on yesterday that I unfortunately had to miss because of what was going on. For those of you who are unaware, yesterday was our inauguration. So we had several of the statewide officials sworn in, everybody from Governor Kay Ivey to her Lieutenant Governor Will Ainsworth, the Secretary of State John Merrill, I mean, on and on and on. Basically, all of those big statewide elections, the officials were sworn in yesterday. And so we're certainly going to be talking about that a little bit, even though it was fairly uneventful. I mean, it was it was pretty standard issue. Let's be honest about it. And Governor Ivey said this, like most of my predecessors, my pathway to this spot was certainly not predetermined or even likely. After all, when I was growing up in my hometown of Camden, little girls simply didn't dream of growing up to one day be elected governor. Alabama is a state where dreams come true because in Alabama, anything is possible. Now, this is one good thing about Kay Ivey, and I've, I've said this, I think, since the beginning of her tenure there. Uh, this is especially important because she has never been the elected governor of the state of Alabama. She was the lieutenant governor that, of course, was put into place once, once Robert Bentley was, uh, I say, removed from office. He actually resigned before he could remove. It was kind of like the whole Nixon thing. You remember that. So Governor Bentley, after it turned out he was using state funds to hide his affair with his mistress and misusing the power of the governor of the state of Alabama, he, of course, wound up resigning, and so because of that, Kay Ivey steps in. But this is the first time Kay Ivey has been the duly elected governor of the state of Alabama, and it is only the second time that Alabamians have had a woman in the governor's mansion. And so this is a significant event, and so whether you agree with Kay Ivey or not, I tend to think of her as more of a mixed bag. I think that there's some things I like, some things I don't. But when it comes to Kay Ivey, it is a cool thing that the state of Alabama has a female governor. I'm not one that thinks you ought to vote for somebody because they check off a list or have all these different intersectionality labels. But if they happen to be in office, I do think that that is a, a neat thing that we happen to have a female governor. And in her speech, she talked about several issues, including infrastructure, health care and broadband access. But in typical Kay Ivey fashion, she did so in a way that virtually nobody could find controversial. Everybody wants more broadband access. Everybody wants better infrastructure, and everybody wants to improve health care. She didn't really give any specifics on plans that she has to do. And, and again, that's just kind of the way that Kay Ivey does things is that she sort of gives lip service to them but doesn't take any real active steps to improve them, it, or at least hasn't yet. She kind of lets the legislature lead, which I don't think is necessarily a horrible strategy. Uh, I mean, frankly, as somebody who tends to be very libertarian – I would rather the government be skeptical of doing anything new. And the fact that Kay Ivey doesn't have a whole lot of agenda items that she pushes herself and becomes more generic and, and almost a little bit of a figurehead, I think is not necessarily a horrible way to run the governorship. I do think there's some serious problems in Alabama when it comes to infrastructure, which we do need to improve, which ironically enough, broadband access actually is infrastructure. So it's almost a little bit redundant. Because our internet services and the uh, fiber optic cables that, that bring high, high speed internet to you, that's actually an infrastructure thing. But I do think that these things ought to be largely handled, not at the state level, but at the local level. And so I see the state intervening too much as, as being problematic. But nonetheless, that was what she talked about yesterday. And like I said from that quote, it was very typical of Kay Ivey. She has a very optimistic outlook. And, and because of that, I do want to talk about something that just came out recently with what a morning consult poll. It showed that Kay Ivey is the third most popular governor in the United States. She only trails behind the governor of Maryland and the governor of Massachusetts. 
She enjoys a 63% approval rating with only a 19% disapproval. And I've asked this question on the internet and I ask this question to you now. Why? And I'm not doing that in a condescending way. I'm not trying to say, oh, well, there's no way that KIV should do that. No, I mean, I'm, honestly, it surprises me a little bit. But I'm genuinely asking you, the audience, and you can call in 860-1440 if you have an inclination to do so. Why? Why is it that KIV is so popular in her state? Why is it that she's so much more popular than other governors, even though she tends to be a, you know, somebody that's kind of milquetoast, not somebody that's really strong or takes a lot of powerful stances on things? Why do you think that she still has a 63% approval rating? third highest in the entire country. And so that's the reason that I ask you those questions. And there were a couple of, of answers that I got the other day that I'm going to share with you in a second. But it, it is just surprising to me that she is beating out governors like Matt Bevan and Greg Abbott from Kentucky and, and Texas, respectively. I mean, Matt Bevan, Greg Abbott, some of the best governors that I think this country's had in a while. Uh, maybe Bobby Jindal, of course, he's not in office anymore, but was the governor of Louisiana. But I mean, Matt Bevin has slashed spending like nobody's business. He's cut taxes in Kentucky. The state is doing really well. The economy's booming. And it just surprises me that he's actually on the lower end of approval rating, despite all the really amazing things he's done. Scott Walker, pretty low approval rating there, governor of Wisconsin. And I don't understand that either because the state's doing better than it has in a really long time. Now, Texas has been doing well for a while, but the fact that Greg Abbott is not higher than Kay Ivey is really kind of stunning to me as well. Because, I mean, if anything, Texas is destroying every other state when it comes to economics right now. Not only is the economy good, but, I mean, they just have a wealth, a wealth of natural resources that they can pull from. And uh, business in Texas is growing. The population is growing. And I'm not just talking about things like illegal immigration, which is obviously a negative. I'm talking about people are flooding to Texas because they have no state income tax whatsoever. And yet they have a surplus, which is they're one of the very few states that actually has a surplus instead of a deficit when it comes to their budget. Even though they have no income tax whatsoever, they have more money than they know what to do with. And it amazes me that somebody like Greg Abbott is not coming anywhere close to beating somebody like Kay Ivey. So again, I'm just asking the question. I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't like Kay Ivey because, again, I voted for her. I didn't think she was the best option out of the Republican field, but I did vote for, for her in the general. So I'm just genuinely asking, why do you think that Kay Ivey is enjoying such a high approval rating? And I tell you what, since we have somebody on the phone right now, we'll go ahead and go to John from Millbrook on line one. Good morning. Yeah, just uh, a few things with regard to her popularity. Sure. First of all, in general, people like women better. Yeah. And I know that's, uh, I think, and in particular this situation, because she's a grandmotherly appearing woman, and you tend to give those folks the benefit of the doubt in most instances. She looks like your grandma, and it's kind of hard not to like your grandmother. And Very I think true. that's part of it. Uh, older people get the benefit of the doubt in many instances, too. Uh, we respect them, even on... Especially on in the South. I would say that yeah. as well. Sure, especially in the South. And and finally, too, uh, she's not in danger of going to the pokey. <laughs> it's, it's a low bar to set, but yeah, I think there's actually some legitimacy to that. I mean, uh, I, we've had so many governors that have been in trouble with the law in various and sundry ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you go back to the guy hunt days and of course mm -hmm. with Siegelman and he served time in the pokey for right. a good while. And then the last just recently got was, out uh, actually, which would make a good made for TV movie with our last governor. Yeah. Before her. I'm surprised and, lifetime hasn't picked up on that yet. Actually. Yeah. Somebody needs to do that movie because that would be fascinating. Of course they would try to make us look bad, which would be easy to do in that particular instance. Well, that instance did make us look bad. So I think that, yeah it's probably fair to make us look bad at that point. Yeah. I mean, seriously, I, I know I'm being funny or, sure. or try attempting to be, but there is some truth to that. When you've had somebody that's so terrible and at least somebody comes in and settles things that tends to make things much better. You don't have the chaos and the, yeah. the soap opera 
uh, drama that we had just got out of, it just seems to work better. Well, now I'm going to give you an analogy and I want to get your idea on it because I know you're a football guy. You remember head football coach at Alabama, Mike Shula, right? Sure. Love Mike Shula. Oh, he's my favorite Alabama coach by a mile. Uh, cause of course he never beat at, uh, Auburn, but anyway, uh, the thing about Mike Shula is he came in on the heels of Mike Price. And for those of you who don't know all the, the backstory, Dennis Franchoni left for another job and then you had Mike Price come in and he never actually coached a football game at Alabama because yeah, I've coached as many as he had. Right. Exactly. Um, he wound up getting caught with some woman in the hotel and I was young, so I don't remember all the details of the story, but Suffice it to say, it was not too unsimilar than what happened to Governor Bentley and his, the allegations of his affair. And so they brought in Mike Shula. And Mike Shula, not necessarily the greatest coach of all time, I think that anybody would be able to say that, didn't necessarily have a stellar record at Alabama, although he had a winning record, I think, every year that he was there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, he was a good coach. Yeah, I mean, not, had- not, not a bad coach, but, you know, he's, he's not Saban. And my point in all of that is, Mike Shula was a nice guy, clean cut, ran a good program, and he was the guy that came in that was there to right the ship. He was there to fix the problems and get away from the scandal of the previous coach, and so they picked like the nicest, most clean cut guy to kind of come and and sort of quell the waters. Now, one thing you're leaving out of this is Mm -hmm. not only that, he was kind of a rock star because women loved him. Yes, they did. Uh, Good looking guy, they really liked him, and... Uh, it was like a rock star, one of the Beatles coming into Birmingham for SEC days because of the media days, because of the way he looked. And, in, in, yeah, and Shula was an Alabama was, guy, and that had a lot to do with it as well. And he was the polar opposite of Price, right? just like she's the polar opposite mm-hmm. of Bentley. And I think that's part of the reason that her approval rating is so high is because, and I'm, I took some sort of unscientific polling on social media and the first thing that I got in everybody's list was something akin to, well, she's not Governor Bentley. Yeah. And I think that really is the number one reason that the, the bar has been set so low that by Kay Ivey basically not sleeping around, has, <laughs> oddly yeah. enough, even though it's a really low bar to clear, that has been enough to propel her to say, well, she's the best governor we've had in a long time. Well, actually, you know, yeah. think about it a little uh in, in some time, I mean, I think most people agreed that Riley was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and that's been a while now. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, one thing I would take exception with you on that you said earlier about the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, and with regard to the Internet. Yeah. And that's one of those things. I equate that to roads and electricity. Well, it should be. That's infrastructure. Right. And so that – you said that, you know, that – uh you do have some problems with it being part of the state mission. I'm paraphrasing there, but I, I think that's kind of what you said. It should be more of the, the market and uh, it should be more controlled by the citizenry. And, and well, local government. Individually as opposed. No, well, local you know. government, I'm just saying, should play a, a larger role because I understand from a. You can't just have companies running lines on public property or private property. I understand that that would be a, a a mess if they tried to do it. I'm just saying that I tend to favor more local control when it comes to those issues because you're going to have to serve that area. There may be some areas that high-speed internet broadband is really important. For example, Auburn. Auburn has taken the lead on making sure that that's something that their community has and they have one of the fastest internet speeds in the country as a result of that, certainly the fastest in the state. And so I, the, I, I believe that uh, Huntsville has another one of the really high internet areas. And so because of that, because they're a um, education institution, there's a lot of young people. They really need a lot of bandwidth. They understand that their infrastructure calls for more of it. So while I'm not saying that I have a problem with the state getting involved at all, I just think that it's something that should be largely handled at the local level because then they can – structure whatever plan that they want in other words how fast an internet they believe that they have to have around the citizenry there instead of having it mandated from montgomery yeah well i appreciate it i got to go all Take right care. thank you much have a good one uh, john from millbrook everybody always appreciate his comments but that was essentially what it all boiled down to is that the surveys that i took on social media they all went down to she's not robert bentley 
or there's no drama. Something akin to basically saying that she's different from the previous administration. And, and I get it. When you have somebody like Robert Bentley that completely broke the, the public trust, that was using state dollars, tax money that hardworking Alabama families, you and I, sent into the state, that when that happens and he uses those resources and uses even our own law enforcement to cover up his affair for his own personal use, and in this case, abuse, then yeah, it looks really bad and you're just thrilled to not have that situation anymore. And so because of it, you tend to settle for something less than stellar. And again, I'm not I'm not down on Kay Ivey. I don't think she's the worst governor in the world. I think that she's probably a lot better than some of the previous governors that we've had. I'm just saying that I think this high approval rating is partly because Alabamians are just thrilled to not have Bentley anymore. And so because of that, I think that it's somewhat inflated based upon that. Another thing that I saw that was listed is that she's nice and positive. And that is good because she has an optimistic outlook for Alabama. Now, when it came to Walt Maddox, one of my criticisms of him is that he was negative about just about everything, which if you're running as the reform candidate, if you're running as the opposition party against an incumbent, you kind of have to be. And I understand that. But I will say this, he wasn't nearly as problematic as somebody like Mallory Hagan or Doug Jones for that matter. And how Doug Jones won, I have no idea. We'll get to that in a second. But when it came to that, they had this sort of, what the best way to say it would be, um, they look down on their own state. I mean, Doug Jones talks about Alabama as though it's some evil backward place. Not nearly as bad as Mallory Hagan, though. I mean, she really led into Alabama and, and talked about how horrible it is and talked about how she was glad to move away. She wanted to get away from the culture. She didn't want to be part of Alabama. And then, of course, she comes back and says, I want to represent this place, which just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But nonetheless, so th that's where we find ourselves. And people really like that Kay Ivey is very optimistic about Alabama. She thinks it's a great place to live. And that's one of the things that people liked about George W. Bush and liked about Trump is that whether or not you agreed with them, they talked about America as though it was just a wonderful place to live. It was the greatest country in the world and they wanted to be here. You have a similar effect going on with Kay Ivey. She is positive. She is optimistic. She likes Alabama. You can tell she wants to live in Alabama. I mean, you get the sense from her speeches that if she weren't the governor, if she weren't a politician, if she had the, the ability with her job to move anywhere she wanted, she'd still live in Alabama. She likes the state. And again, that's a really low bar, but for whatever reason in the state of Alabama, there are an awful lot of politicians that just dog the state and talk about it like it's a terrible place to live. And that doesn't play well with voters. I think even a lot of the voters that voted for those candidates only tolerate that they talk about it that way. And so I think that that was a really big contributing factor as well. Uh, another thing that was mentioned is that she's a Republican, which of course is true. And I had a buddy get in touch with me and said, I think it's just easier if you're in a deep blue state or a deep red state to be able to please your constituents because more people think the way you do. There's more political agreement than it would be in a, a purple state or a swing state. I don't think that's altogether untrue. I think that he's definitely on to something there. And look at the the governors that were in the top. That tends to play out. I mean, like I just said, Massachusetts and Maryland happen to be a couple of the governors that were at the top. And then what I was talking about just recently, a guy that I think is a phenomenal governor, Matt Biven, was near the bottom. And Kentucky is a purple state. I mean, it tends to lean red. But there's a lot of Democrats in the state of Kentucky. And it tends to be pretty well split. There's a lot of statewide offices that are held by Democrats right now. And so because of that and keeping that in mind, I think that there is something to that idea that because Kay Ivey happens to be in a very, very ruby red state, in fact, the only state that I think you could make the argument may be more on the Republican side might be West Virginia based on the most previous election. And, and that... I think even may not be so just because one of the reasons that West Virginia went so hard for Trump is because they were tired of Obama and Hillary Clinton going after their primary source of income, which of course is coal. 
And so because of that and because they had been doing that, West Virginia has definitely moved more into the Republican category. But I just genuinely wonder, I don't know, if they are not actually quite as conservative as Alabama, they just really don't like the green jobs initiative stuff. And so because of that, you know, you have a very, very red state with a Republican governor. And because of that, you're going to have a lot more agreement, a lot more consensus when it comes to that. So I do think that that is a contributing factor. Now, another thing, too, is that the economy is doing pretty well. If the economy sucks, you probably would not have a 63% approval rating. But one of the things that was mentioned, like I said, by the people that I asked this question to is the economy is doing well. And it is. We've got the lowest unemployment rate that we've had in a long, long time. We have new businesses popping up all over the place. Economically, Alabama is growing. It tends to be on the rise. There are several areas in the state of Alabama that are doing really well. Auburn area, for example, we were just talking about that on our call with John from Millbrook. That is the 11th fastest growing city in the country. That, that Auburn, Opelika area, 11th fastest growing in the country. That's astounding that that's happening in the state of Alabama. And Huntsville is right on up there with it. I don't know exactly what its number is. I would imagine it's actually higher than the Auburn, Opelika area, but I don't know that for a fact. But that's one of the things that you're noticing that a lot of these people, that even though they are socially liberal and, and like a lot of liberal policies, they're going to states with low income taxes or no income taxes at all, like in the state of Texas. And so you're seeing this migration because you know what state gained the most citizens last year? Texas. You know which one lost the most citizens last year? California. And so you're seeing people actually fleeing some of these kooky liberal policies and these insanely high taxes. And then they're coming to redder states. And Alabama is in part the beneficiary of that. And another thing, too, businesses do the same thing. When you have the option of building in a blue state where they're going to tax the mess out of you, or you can go to a southern state, you know, Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, something like that, to where the taxes are pretty minimal, then it makes sense as long as the, the environment is right, you have infrastructure for shipping, and you can get an educated base, an educated workforce, then yeah, why not go to a, a southern state? Why not move down there? It may even be more economical to bring people with you and have them move with your company, if that's the case. And so because of that, you're seeing this real boom in the south, in the southeast specifically, with all of these new businesses coming in. And so part of that, I think, is I, I don't know that I would necessarily give Kay Ivey credit for that. I'm not saying that she doesn't deserve any credit because she's obviously not doing anything to try to impede it, which is good. But I wouldn't necessarily say that that is the result of the Kay Ivey administration. I think that would probably be happening regardless of whether she was in office or not. Just, just being honest with you, I think that would be happening whether or not Kay Ivey was in office. And the entire country is on an economic upturn right now. And because of that, I think she's also the beneficiary of that as well. Now, again, given her credit, she's not doing anything to impede it. She's not doing anything to screw it up. But I don't know that you can point to a particular policy or a particular bill that she has signed and say, yep, K. Ivy, that's the reason that happened. I just don't think you can do that. I don't think the case is really there. So that being said, let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about that. When it comes down to it, I've given you a lot of other people's opinions and sort of my take on it. Here's my opinion, and this is really what I think. She's not dynamic, but she's not rocking the boat either. And right now in this political climate where everything is the biggest problem that has ever happened and everything is worthy of outrage and freaking out over and being at other people's throats, the fact that Governor Ivey does really none of that, I think, oddly enough, in this day of age, Doing practically nothing is the best way to get a high approval rating. I mean, she just kind of sits in the shadows. She never debated during the primary. She never debated during the general election. And really just sort of staying out of the limelight and just quietly signing things into law. and, and go. That really is, I think, the best way to win approval at this point. She has gotten to the point to where she can just kind of, as long as she doesn't do anything dumb... 
she's going to enjoy a fairly high approval rating by people in the state, even people that tend to lean somewhat left. And I don't know how much of that is fair. I don't know how much of it is actually earned. But nonetheless, it is what it is. And you can't deny that it exists. And so that's really where we stand right now. So I, I think that that's the reason that you're seeing these high approval ratings. And in our political climate, people prefer someone that's not going to rock the boat to good policy. Can't explain it necessarily, but that's the reason that they do it. Most people aren't nerds like I am that read the bills and, and look into exactly what they do. And so just not being Robert Bentley, I think, is the number one thing that is causing her to skyrocket to the top. So there was also in that same polling, that same company that did the polling for KIV, less flattering news. We'll put it that way. Far less flattering news for our Senator Doug Jones. So Abortion Jones, his first poll after the Kavanaugh hearings, he has dropped 17 points since this time last year. They took the same poll basically in 2018 of the approval rating that he had. And according to this, he has dropped 17 points since the last time he was asked. So the most recent findings are that 40% approve of the job that he's doing, 35% disapprove, and 25% either didn't have an opinion or don't know who Doug Jones is. Now, this to me is really astounding because the 40% approve, the 35% disapprove, that, that bothers me a little bit and it does, okay, it bothers me a lot. It bothers me because he is such a terrible senator. It bothers me because he does not in any way reflect the values of Alabama. But I'm telling you right now, with those numbers, the odds of him getting reelected practically non-existent. You can't have almost in the 30s on your approval rating with almost that many people disapproving of you and expect to win an election. I mean, unless something weird or freakish happens, Doug Jones really doesn't have a prayer if you're looking at these numbers in 2020. Now, maybe he can turn those numbers around, but I highly doubt it. And this is a 17-point net loss, and I understand that. That's significant. He is trending downward really fast. But there's still 5% more of Alabamians that approve of his job than disapprove. That is astounding. That blows my mind that there are people that still think he's doing a good job. I mean, the, the far leftist, that I, I kind of understand why they think that. But the ones that are Republicans, which this state is overwhelmingly Republican, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted by the fact that there are still 40% of people that think he's doing a good job and only 35% that disapprove of the job he's doing. But to me, perhaps the most amazing part of this whole thing is the fact that there are still 25% of people that either don't have an opinion on him or don't know who he is. How does that happen? And I know that I'm biased. I know that I'm a political geek and I'm into this stuff and I study it. And so to me, that does seem boring. But honestly, how does that happen? How is it that 25% of, and this isn't general population, this is registered voters. How is it that 25% of America's people that are actually registered to vote still have no idea who Doug Jones is? That absolutely blows my mind. And the, the way that he's taken a stance against life, the way that he said abortion should basically be on demand with his vote for abortions to be legal after 25 weeks, which, by the way, America is still only one of six countries that still allows abortion after 25 weeks. Only, only one out of six. And you look at the list. It is not countries that you want to be associated with. I mean, it's like... Uh, it's like uh, Iran and China. I mean, it's 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 not good company. We'll just put it that way. And so um, you're looking at this. I say Iran. I, Iran actually wasn't one of them. It was North Korea and China. Um, but anyway, you're looking at this, and you quickly understand that the average person is just not paying attention. And this is a glowing testimonial to that. I wish it were different, guys. I wish that these issues actually mattered to people and people actually studied them. But the truth is, they don't. They don't. And this proves it. If you don't know who Doug Jones is by now, you don't know who your own senator is, you're just a low-information voter and there's not a whole lot that can be done about that. 
we can go out, we can spread the word, we can talk about it, we can do it one person at a time, but I'm telling you, the vast majority of them, they just do not keep up with this stuff. And now that Doug Jones has a war chest and he's going to have signs up all over the state of Alabama during re-election, again, I don't think that he can get re-elected. The numbers don't bear that out, but we shouldn't count him out yet. Because when you consider so few people even recognize who he is, that means that he is going to be counting on, just like he did in the last election, the ignorance of people on where he stands on the issues to try to get reelected. So Stuart Rothenberg, he's a national political analyst for Roll Call, said, I don't think that Jones has much of a chance of holding on to his seat this year. Simply put, his special election win was a fluke, not likely to be repeated. Jones' special election victory was entirely due to Moore's nomination. Now, this is a guy that doesn't have skin in the fight. He's not a Republican. He's just a political analyst, and he's looking at the numbers, and he's saying, look, I'm just telling you what I see. The last election was because Roy Moore was the candidate, because he wound up winning that primary, and I just don't see any competent Republican going up against him and losing this next round. He said it was a fluke, and I think that he's probably right on that. That's what I've been saying for, well, since he got elected. And I, actually, it was the next day that I said this was a fluke, and I don't think that you're going to see this happen. You're not going to see Alabama turn blue or anything like that, like all the national people were trying to suggest. No, that, that, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. And based on these numbers, that's probably going to bear itself out. There is virtually no chance of this happening. Uh, there's virtually no chance of Doug Jones winding up getting reelected, which is the reason that now is the time. Now is the time for Republicans to come together and when this primary happens, pick a real conservative, not a mushy moderate, not somebody that's part of the good old boy crowd, an actual conservative. We don't need Richard Shelby Jr. We need somebody that is actually going to be dynamic, going to be new, and going to be an actual constitutional conservative that is going to take his oath of office to defend the Constitution very seriously. Because the odds of him not winning this election are practically non-existent. So this is not the time to pick somebody that we think will be able to please the middle or anything like that. This is the time to get a conservative. This is a time to get somebody that is going to stand up for Alabama's values, stand up for rights, for the rights of the unborn, for the rights of gun owners, so on and so forth. We need somebody that's a real warrior, somebody in the mold of Mike Lee, somebody in the mold of Ted Cruz. Alabama could be one of those states. And to a great degree, we had that back when Jeff Sessions was the senator. So now I think it's time in this next election that we have somebody that is a real conservative in that office. Because I just think that he's going to steamroll Doug Jones based on his current approval ratings. So the prospects for Jones are bad, but not impossible. Remember that 25% of people don't even know who he is. And what astounded me is 25% of people in the same poll, turns out they don't know who Richard Shelby is either. Now, Richard Shelby did a lot better because he had a 70, uh, 47% approval and only a 27% disapproval. But he still had a quarter of people that also didn't know who he is. And when you've got that large amount of people that just don't have an opinion on somebody that has been around, he's been their senator since before I was born. When you've got somebody like that in office and 25% of people either don't have an opinion on him or don't know who he is, you're dealing with a lot of low information voters. And so not time to rest on our laurels, not a time to assume that we can just win this, but I do think that it is time to elect a real dynamic, bold conservative because he's got a good chance of going in and just trouncing Doug Jones. I think it ought to be Mo Brooks, but there's several other people I could see doing it. Maybe Gary Palmer, maybe somebody from the state. I would be fine with United States Senator Dick Brubaker. I don't know that he's got the name recognition to pull that off, but I think he would certainly be able to beat Doug Jones. For those of you who don't know, every single year, the White House hosts the national champions. And this year that happened to be Clemson. So they, they went to the BCS. They wound up beating Alabama, of course. This is something that everybody in the state knows. I don't have to repeat it. And so Clemson goes on 
and they go to the White House, meet with President Trump. Government's shut down right now, which means that there's no budget to be able to pay for the dinner. And they always have this nice, fancy steak dinner, that kind of thing. So what Trump does is he's like, oh, you know, they're, they're supposed to be coming over. I don't want to ruin their visit because of the shutdown. So I'm going to pay for it myself. So Trump takes his own money and goes out and buys a dinner for them. They're in the state dining room. They're meeting with the president and all this stuff. And what Trump does is instead of getting some fancy, uh, fancy catering company or something like that, he buys 300 hamburgers, <laughs> gets them from McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King, and also buys a whole bunch of Domino's pizza. And he sets it out. And what's so hilarious about this whole thing, and you'll see it in a second, um, he just he sets it out just like you would any other state dinner, but instead of like, you know, steak or lobster or whatever else that they usually have at, at state dinners, <laughs> they just have uh, this spread of burgers and uh, pizza. And so here's the president actually talking about that. He, he ordered fast food for the boys, and, and this is him bragging about it. So here's the president. Now, what's your favorite thing here, Mr. President? Stuff. Do you great, great American food. And it'll be very interesting to see at the end of this evening how many are left. Do you prefer McDonald's or Wendy's? I, I like them all. That's a tough question. If it's not it's a American, softball. I like it. It's all American stuff. So, but it's good stuff. And we have the national champion team, as you know, Clemson Tigers. And they had a fantastic game against Alabama. And they're all here. They're right outside the room. And I think we're going to let you uh, see them. But I'll bet you as much food as we have. We have pizzas. We have 300 hamburgers. Many, many french fries. All of our favorite foods. Uh, I want to see what's here when we leave. Because I don't think it's going to be much. <laughs> so th this is classic Trump. I mean, it really is. This is the epitome of Trump's personality. If you want to showcase what Trump's personality is like, that's it right there. He is a normal blue collar guy with a crap ton of money. <laughs> and this is this is really what he he does. I mean, it's it's this weird combination of like blue collar stuff and fancy. Because you you see the the very elegant ballroom and the Camberellas and everything and on these big fancy silver trays they've got 300 hamburgers. I just find that ridiculously amusing. And, and this is the thing about Trump. He's a very entertaining human being. That's the reason he was on TV for as long as he is. That's the reason that even though he was just kind of famous for being famous, that's the reason people were drawn to him. He is this big, larger than life personality. And this is the thing that a lot of people liked about Trump is that he comes off as very authentic. He is the guy that would just on his way to work or something uh, on his way to a business meeting, he's got to get lunch, say, hey, you know what? Drive through that that Burger King. And he stops by a Burger King and goes through the drive through in his limo. And with him, it's not a publicity stunt. It's not a novelty thing. He just wanted a Whopper. I mean, that's just the kind of guy Donald Trump is. And for all of his flaws, which are many, and all of his problems that he has, th the guy's not inauthentic. Even when he says things that aren't necessarily true, and when that happens, I point it out, even then, it comes off as though he actually believes it, and he probably does. He's probably just mistaken. And this is sort of a showcase of that, because you, you've got this weird combination of blue-collar and fancy. And the reason that this, I think, makes Donald Trump very relatable is that if you got the call, the people that called you up and said, uh, look, you're going to host the national champion Clemson Tigers tonight, you're going to be in charge of that. We're coming over to your house and having dinner. This is exactly what you would do. If you knew that you were going to host for a football team, you would go out and you would buy a bunch of burgers or a bunch of sandwiches or a bunch of pizza or whatever else. This is how you would have handled that. And so because of that, this is something that people find very relatable about Trump because he reacts to things basically not much differently than the average American would. And he comes off insincere in that, and I think that he actually is. I, I like it. It's great American food. I like Wendy's. I like McDonald's. Now, out of those, I would prefer Wendy's way more to the other two. That's just my personal opinion. But the point in all of this is it's just an entertaining thing to do, and I think that the boys probably 
liked Clemson, uh, at Clemson probably liked the burgers and the pizza more than they would have some kind of fancy uh, gaudy steak dinner. They probably really appreciated that. And so this is the thing. If you were hosting your son's football team, this is basically how you would react to that. And people resonate with that, and they like that about Trump. And so whether or not you agree with the guy politically or not, you got to admit this is entertaining, and this is sort of a showcasing Trump's down-to-earth authenticity. It's who the guy is. And this was really putting that on display. So let's go ahead and talk about, I'll tell you what, we'll just go ahead and go to the Daily Dose of Stupid. That is if I can find the Daily, there we go. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. All right, so today's Daily Dose of Stupid, there was a, uh, there's this event going on right now that I don't like to talk about because honestly it it kind of grosses me out. But it's going on in the news, and so I thought that we needed to talk about it. There's this thing that they call Janu Harry. And it's sort of a play off of and started in the wake of November, Movember. And where what that is is guys just don't shave for the month of November, and it's supposed to be done to raise awareness for prostate cancer. And so because of that, you shave your face and then you grow it out as long as you can. Don't shave it all in the month of November. It, the whole thing was started because it was supposed to raise money and raise awareness for prostate cancer. This one's really just more on a whim. But there was this girl apparently who came out and she had to grow her body hair out for some role in a play. Now, what role that was in a play, I have no idea. But because of that, she got the idea that every January she would just grow out her hair and not shave at all. Legs, armpit, whatever. And this became a thing that she launched, the January campaign, to where women just don't shave their body hair during the month of January. And it's not to raise money or raise awareness for anything. It's just because they think that they shouldn't have to. So just to give you an idea of this, here's the graphic... I think I've got it up here. Yeah, there we go. So this is the girl that started the whole thing. You can see that she's not shaved her underarms. Yeah, otherwise, a very attractive young lady. But that just, I don't know, it grosses me out. And it really gets on my nerves. But I do want to give her full credit. I do want to let her kind of speak for herself. So we'll go to a quote from her. She said that this isn't an angry campaign for people who don't see how normal body hair is but more of an empowering project for everyone to understand more about their views on themselves and others. So I will say this. I don't think this girl is a screaming liberal. I don't think that she's shouting about the patriarchy and saying how oppressed they are. She's just saying that I like to grow up my body hair and I think other women should be able to as well. I don't really see how that's empowering, but it's uh, whatever. I mean, it, it's no skin off my hide, but that's really the the thing that this is going to. I think that there are some people in the movement that have kind of co-opted it and are talking about oppression and the patriarchy and uh, un, unreasonable beauty standards and other things. But look, I just see it as hygienic and it bothers me when women look kind of like guys. Like, I don't want a woman to look like the guy that I'm next to the locker room in with hair all over. Maybe that makes me picky. I don't know, but I tend to think that this is a little over the top. Now, again, you do what you want. Basically, that's what all this boils down to. It's your body, your hair. You do what you want to with it. Doesn't bother me. But here's the thing that I do want to offer as a cautionary note. Just because I don't have a problem with you doing it doesn't mean I have to like it. Because one of the things that they're talking about is normalizing it and making it to where people are more accepting of it. You can't do that because you can't change what a person's preferences are. And this is something that I've been saying for a very long time when it came to the whole fat shaming thing. It's like, look, there's a lot of guys that like bigger women. There's probably guys that like women that have more body hair or at the very least don't mind it. And that's perfectly okay. If you find a guy that, that likes you the way you are, that doesn't mind that, have at it. But don't expect people or don't think that people are wrong or evil for having different preferences. Personally, I'm not going to go out with a girl that doesn't shave. 
if you think that that's closed minded or whatever, that's fine, but you still can't change my preferences. There are some women that do not like a beard. And as you can tell, I've got one. And because of that, there are some women that would not date me. In fact, I've had women tell me that they don't like my beard before. That's fine. I accept that some women are not going to like my beard. Some women like it. Some women actually prefer men with beards. And I accept that there that is going to happen, that there are going to be some women that like it, some people that don't. You can't change a person's preferences. You can't make them like something that they don't like. And it's not because they hate me or they're being bigoted or anything like that. They just happen to like the way a man looks clean shaven. And that's fine. There are women that like skinny guys. I know that's weird, but I mean, they, they like really skinny, narrow, unmuscular guys. I'm not talking about just like not fat. I'm talking about little bitty guys. They think they're attractive. Okay. That's up to you. That's not me. But if that's what you want, go after it. If, if that's the, the thing that you're looking for, you need to find somebody other than me. <laughs> you know, and I'm fine with that. There are some women that just aren't attracted to that. And so because of that, I do think that we sometimes get our, I, I do think that sometimes we go over the top with this, that we get upset that somebody isn't attracted to us. And look, it's a, it's a difficult thing to be rejected by people. It's a difficult thing to know that somebody that you're attracted to doesn't like you back. That's hard to deal with. But here's the thing that we've got to remember. And I'm going to tell this story as an illustration. I had a good friend of mine who was on the debate team with me in at Auburn. I'm not going to name who it is because, you know, there would be people that would be able to find it out and she may be watching. I don't know. Anyway, she became a female bodybuilder after college, after I knew her. And she has posted pictures of herself and she's, you know, ripped, muscular. You know what a female bodybuilder looks like. And she's uh, very, very built. And she's actually won awards for her bodybuilding. And there are people that have told her that she looks ugly and manly and gross and they don't want to see it and all this other stuff. And she brought this to my attention. And the way I responded was, look, personally, I don't like it either. I don't like women that look super muscular. There are other guys that do, and that's fine. No problem with me, but I don't. I said, but here's the thing. And I happen to know that at the time she had a fiance who now she's married to. And, and I think they actually have a kid on the way. But I said, look, the, the guy that you are engaged to, he likes it. He thinks you're gorgeous. And so why do you care what anybody else thinks about how you look? Because you need to look good for your partner. You need to be able to be appealing to them in some way, or at least do the best that you can. But he likes that you look that way. And so why does my opinion or anybody else's opinion matter? The only ones that we should really be trying to look good for, I mean, unless you're like a model or something like that, where your job specifically pertains to how you look, the only person you should really care about how they see you and, and whether or not they think you're attractive is that person. And so there are going to be other people that don't like how you look. It doesn't matter. Write them off. Don't care about that. Worrying about that just builds up unnecessary anxiety. And this is a girl that back when she was, you know, more normal looking, in other words, you know, more of a, an average figure, somebody that I found attractive and once she bulked up really didn't. But you know what? Doesn't matter. I'm not dating her. And so we have to quit trying to veil ourselves in the the disguise of saying you need to be tolerant and saying what we're really saying is you need to like me exactly the way I am without making any changes. That's the problem that we're running into. Is that we're trying to say, well, you're being intolerant because you don't accept me the way that I am. Look, other people are going to have preferences and that's fine. And you know what? For you not accepting that they have preferences, you're the one being intolerant. And so I think we just need to assume the best in people whenever we can and give other people a break. I think that's going to avoid a lot of these problems and a lot of these hurt feelings afterward. Now, granted, it's never right for you to just come out and volunteer the information and tell them that you don't think that you look good. I mean, unless you're trying to help them in some way. But the point is, when you're looking at this whole January thing, if people want to do it, that's their business. But just don't expect other people 
to like it or be in favor of it or to be fine with it. You know, you've got preferences, they've got preferences, that's okay, but don't hold other people to your standard when it comes to that. Because in the end, beauty is all subjective. And there is going to come a time where none of us are going to have a physical body anyway, and so that stuff is really not going to matter all that much. All right, let's go ahead and go to the chaplain's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's report today comes from the book of Daniel. We've been going through the book of Daniel for a couple of weeks now and been trying to dive really deep into the scripture, which I have really enjoyed being able to go through this narrative with you. And just to get you caught up to speed, what Daniel is doing right now is he has just interpreted for the king what his dream actually means. He's informed him, this is what you're looking at. This is what these different symbols mean. And he tells him, that his dream is supposed to predict the future. And when he does this, he has a reaction that I don't think Daniel was expecting and frankly probably didn't want. And we're going to go ahead and go to the scripture in Daniel 2, 46 through 48 to get that story. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present him an offering of a fragrant incense. And the king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole providence of Babylon, and chief perfect over all the wise men of Babylon. Now you think about this. This is a man who is a pagan king that has been drenched in pagan culture his entire life. And you can tell even by his language that this is who he was. He says it's a god of gods. In other words, he's acknowledging God's power, but he's essentially saying that there are other gods and they still exist too, but your god is superior to them. Which is true because their gods don't exist, but my point in all of this is he doesn't immediately change his entire perception of the world. He doesn't immediately get rid of all of his old ideas and beliefs when this happens. Because he's not been taught that. Daniel hasn't come and told him that there is only one God. He hasn't instructed him in the laws of Moses or any of that. But here's the thing. He knows something that's effective when he sees it. It's one of those things that even an atheist can quickly understand Christian charity and kindness when they see it take place in someone's life. And so because of that, we can see the amazing effect that God's power through Daniel had on King Nebuchadnezzar that even he realized, not knowing anything about God other than it was the God that Daniel worshipped, he understood all of these truisms about God just from the act of Daniel interpreting his dream because the power of God changes people. When he saw that, that this God can see the future and he's the one that sent the dream to Nebuchadnezzar and because of that he was able to interpret the dream and to do so through Daniel, he takes a step back and goes, whoa, whichever God you're worshipping, that is a god of gods. He's obviously more powerful than all the gods of the magicians and the Chaldeans and all the gods that I'm worshiping because your god actually got results. Your god actually was able to tell me what my dream meant. See, he was able to very quickly recognize that the Chaldeans and the magicians that had been meeting with him before, they were fakes. They didn't have any real supernatural power. And that's why he got so infuriated is because they told him, well, we can only do it if you inter you tell the dream to us and then we interpret it. He's like, no, no, no. If you want to prove to me that you really are who you say you are, you have to tell me the dream and you have to interpret it back to me and tell me what it means. Daniel was able to do that, even though Daniel had never heard the dream. And Daniel acknowledges very quickly, he's like, look, this isn't me doing it. There's nothing special about me. I don't have supernatural powers. I'm just getting this information from God. And because of that, Nebuchadnezzar realizes that, understands it, even though he doesn't understand fully or doesn't understand what all that means, he understands the basic message that Daniel has given to him, that this is what my God can do. 
And because my God sent you the dream in the first place, he's the one that can tell you exactly how this all played out. And I love the verbiage that he uses here. A king of kings, uh, a lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries. And because of that, you've been able to reveal this mystery. Which is true. God is a bringer of light to that which is unclear, that which is dark. And because of that, he's seeing all these other gods, these pagan gods, that are shrouded in mystery, and you can never see them, and you don't really see them interact with human beings. Now he's seeing a real god that actually plays a part in not only the lives of people that know him, but also his own life who didn't know this god that Daniel is speaking of. So this god that is universal across the entire human race, that works with everybody. And this is a God that previously Nebuchadnezzar had no idea was even there. So that's why Nebuchadnezzar is so astounded. Now, he also does delve into what could be obviously seen as worship in Daniel. I'm imagining probably rebuked that pretty quickly, considering we know who Daniel was. It doesn't mention specifically that he did that in this particular verse, but I, I tend to imagine that he did just because of the way that he's presented this whole thing as being, this should be given credit to God, not to me. I'm not the one doing this. God's the one that's really in charge, and he's the reason that I'm able to see into the dream that you're talking about. But what I really do believe is astounding about this is because God, this one act by the Lord, had such a profound impact on the life of a pagan king. I think it says how big an impact that we, when we share the gospel with others, can have on their life. That it's like their eyes have been opened and they'll see all these things just click together that make sense. And occasionally when you teach somebody in the Bible and you see that click happen, you see their face light up, you see them finally put those pieces together to where it all makes sense. Well then, something really amazing happens. You can really see the power of God's word and his message and his truth working in their mind and in their soul. This is something that Lewis himself actually talked about. C.S. Lewis said that he believed in God, but for the same reason he believed in the sun. Not only could he see that the sun was risen, but he could see everything else as a result of the sun having risen. And that's really the way that God's truth is supposed to work. That not only do we see God's truth, but every other truth around us starts making more sense because we have that basis of truth in God. And this is what happened in Nebuchadnezzar, that, that small little window of that opened up, and all of a sudden he saw, whoa, all this other stuff starts making sense. And so, really, it just shows the power of God's word and his truth and how it can affect even somebody that doesn't really know him. And that's the kind of effect that we should be seeking to have on the rest of the world. It's also the effect that God's truth ought to have on us. We ought to live in this constant sense of wonder of God's majesty and his power. Stay the course, friends.